This week, we go on an excellent adventure. Take dance lessons from a tomato and get invaded by flossing aliens. Giant alien heads, Pokemon gyms, and massive queues to get into the Los Angeles Convention Center. For hardcore gamers, this can only mean one thing. It's time for the Electronic Entertainment Expo. Or just plain old E3, to those in the know. Almost a quarter of a century on from the very first show, it's now the premier event in the gaming calendar, with over 70,000 people making the annual pilgrimage to the show floor. Although why they need a rock climbing wall, I'm not quite sure. And so we sent along our very own gaming gurus, Kate Russell and Mark Chislak, to see what everyone will be talking about this year. This E3 is a little bit different though. Since 2017, the public has been allowed in. Before that, this was a games industry only affair. Usually PlayStation and Xbox hold giant competing press conferences to show off their latest software and hardware. However, PlayStation isn't attending E3 2019 at all. And that left Xbox as the only big games company with an actual piece of hardware doing a press briefing. Get ready. In typically bombastic fashion, Xbox's event is big and loud. Please welcome Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves brought some star power to proceedings, turning on the charm. <laughs> You're breathtaking. You're all breathtaking. As it was revealed, he'll be appearing in the highly anticipated Cyberpunk 2077 which will be released in April next year. As well as this, we got glimpses of Gears of War 5 and Minecraft role-playing spin-off Minecraft Dungeons. But in the battle between PlayStation, Xbox and Nintendo for domination of the game's console market, the biggest announcement wasn't a new game. XCloud is Microsoft's new game streaming service, allowing Xbox games to be played on a host of devices like smartphones by streaming the game's visuals from a Microsoft data center. I'm streaming a game using XCloud right now. This is actually an Xbox One console game that I'm playing on a mobile phone. Now, normally, of course, a mobile phone wouldn't be powerful enough to play a game like this one. The game itself is actually being hosted on a console inside a server 400 miles away. The service will preview in October. There isn't any word on pricing yet, though. But while streaming movies and TV shows is fairly commonplace, big questions are being asked about this kind of technology and if games can be reliably streamed over domestic internet connections. One of the biggest comments that we've had from our readers on our site is about the performance and how fast the internet that you have at home is going to be to be able to support this kind of game streaming. You know, people are struggling to run 4K Netflix, uh, long YouTube videos and things like that. Are you going to be able to have the internet speeds to match that performance? Imagine streaming TV and movies as data travelling down a one-way street in the direction of your television, computer or mobile device. Streaming video games is a lot more complicated. Here we have a two-way street. In one direction, we've got the graphics, that's the on-screen visuals, and then in the other direction, we have the inputs that the player is making to control the game they're playing. All of this has to happen incredibly quickly. If it doesn't, well, then the whole thing breaks down. Despite these reservations, games developers believe that although quality might sometimes be an issue, modern home networks can handle it. Well, companies tried in the past and we've been experimenting with them. I think what really changed is your connectivity in your home is better than ever. Those internet companies have built network data centers close to your home to bring a lot of content already through video, Netflix, YouTube, etc. So we can rely on a much better infrastructure to bring the game. 
The second thing is that we learned how to adapt the game to your network conditions so that we can really make sure that even if your quality is a bit lower because of your network, you can still enjoy the game as best as possible. Microsoft's announcement comes after tech giant Google caused a stir, signaling it wanted to get into gaming. Google says its new game streaming service called Stadia could signal the end of the physical console. Google's making bold claims about Stadia and no console required. Some people are saying that the console is dead, is that true? For us, we've learned that it's always about gamer's choice. Listen to what your customer wants, and we have millions and millions of customers, and it's not just us. The industry has millions and millions of customers who look at the console experience that they have as something that's vital, their gaming experience. We're not here to try to take that away or tell somebody that the choices they've made are wrong. Both Microsoft and Sony seem to be hedging their bets, as a new, more powerful PlayStation 5 console is already in the works and Xbox has announced Project Scarlet, which will be capable of 8K graphics and will do away with load times due to processing grunt, and will be backwards compatible with the entire Xbox library of games, and that's on the way for November next year. Game streaming may well be the future, but it isn't game over for the physical console just yet. E3 is of course chock full of games. Games and, well, more games. There are so many that frankly it's easy to get a bit lost. But here are a few that stood out for us. I grew up on Wolfenstein in its various different guises, so I am super excited for Youngblood. Two player co op? Let's do it, sister. BJ Blaskovich is missing, and his twin daughters head out for some two player co op shooter action. It's not a massive budget title, but it is accessible across all main platforms, including Switch, and it's due out next month, which makes it a rare beast for E3. We also got the first real sight of gameplay from this much-anticipated single-player third-person action-adventure from the Star Wars franchise. I saw a dev playing through the opening, Frustrating not to get hands on myself, but it looks amazing with interesting combat mechanics using force abilities, wall running, and of course, what's not to love about lightsaber battles and the cute little droid that sits on your shoulder. It should be on sale for Christmas. Hey, who are you? I've been waiting for this to be playable all year. Borderlands 3. The comic book artwork and ridiculous weapons make this instantly recognisable as from the Borderlands series. <laughs> Mose the Gunner is a new member of the Vault Hunter cast and she rocks a mech. Yeah, OK, you can leave me here. I have demolition work to do. And it's another game you can put on your Christmas list as it's due out in September. Square Enix has assembled some of Marvel's greatest heroes, the Avengers, to star in a new narrative-driven third-person action game. Hello, San Francisco! It's going to feature a story delivered as chapters, downloadable over a period of years. A questionable decision that, as far as fans are concerned, is proving as unpopular as the unrecognisable and considerably cheaper than paying for image rights Avengers lineup that appears in the game. Make this quick. The Master Chief finally returns next year in Halo Infinite, a game that will likely be a technical tour de force as it's the flagship launch title for Xbox's newly announced super powerful console, Project Scarlet. We're yet to see any gameplay, but the E3 trailer hinted that a catastrophe has befallen mankind, and the Chief looks like he's getting a new AI best buddy. I chose you because you were special. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that US border officials admitted a hack. Photos and license plates of around 100,000 travelers have been compromised. WhatsApp announced it would take legal action against people sending spam messages on its platform. The crackdown is set to start in December. And Uber said that Australia would be the first international market for its flying taxi service, Uber Air. The startup is already launching a separate helicopter service in New York next month. Now this might look like Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, 
but it's actually a fake video, and the social media mogul says it will stay online. The sham footage was posted to Facebook-owned Instagram by an artist who's been making celebrity deepfakes for a UK art exhibition. British grocery delivery business Ocado has invested £17 million into companies developing vertical farms, where veggies are stacked upwards in shelves. The retail tech firm plans to grow leafy greens in these indoor farms next to its distribution centres. And finally, a robot has been taught to use irony. Really? Showcased at an AI conference in Canada, the aptly named Irony Man has been taught to nail a combination of nonchalant facial expressions and deadpan delivery. I really hate fast food. It is not healthy at all. I really love fast food. Its German makers say the bot is both more likeable and more motivating. Augmented reality to a real-life karting experience using these Magic Leap headsets adds a whole new level of fun you'd usually only expect to get in a video game. Well, we use game engines uh, to develop a 3D world and then we take an absence of an environment uh, through a camera feed and then we place the digital world into our world. Virtual reality is taking an individual and bringing them to a virtual environment. Uh, you know, enclosed. Augmented is taking that digital world and intertwining it with ours so you can uh, create more of a realistic experience. Now this is the kind of experience that is definitely not infringing anybody's copyright. The experience is supposed to be collaborative. Rather than racing, Kate and I are working together to take out all of the bad guys. Off the track, spectators can throw power-ups and also bomb us to slow us down if that's what they want to do. Hunt, louder, cross, Senna, nothing on Chislak and Russell. So it's clearly early days for the technology, but there we are, I've got a power-up now, and that power-up allows me to boost across the finish line. Welcome to the Indie Zone. With understated booths and a noticeable lack of queues, this is where you'll find true originality on show. You must blend seamlessly into human society. Speaking Simulator is about a robot who's trying to infiltrate humanity just by having conversations like we're having now. So players have to manipulate the mouth and the tongue to make their words come out. And you have to do it very quickly because if you don't, your face will start to explode because you're a robot. And humans find that a little bit suspicious. Oh, my teeth are falling out. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, it's all gone horribly wrong. Well, that's the way I end most E3s, to be honest. It's a place where you can sit down and talk about art. Earth Knight is a hand-painted dragon apocalypse, 2D platformer, love letter to classic games like Mario and Sonic and old arcade games. It's a, I don't know, it's a procedurally generated nightmare, I guess. Everything is trying to kill you, but everything is really beautiful. You're so close, you're so close, yes! Now you're a dragon slayer. I am a dragon slayer. Do you have a painting you'd like to play with? Um, yeah, let's go with the... Let's go with the screen. All right, sounds good. So we have a minute and a half to try and recreate the painting. <laughs> Put it out there. And, uh. Or take a detour into alternative pop culture. Boyfriend Dungeon is a dating simulator dungeon crawler mashup. Basically, your weapons turn into beautiful people. You take them out on dates to make them grow stronger. Yeah, we love dating sims, but we always thought it could, would be really fun to kind of break it up with like some sort of action, and that was combat for us. And basically, we thought like a lot of dating sims were really geared towards um, a certain kind of audience. It was very like R-rated, a lot of like you know females not wearing a lot of things. So we kind of wanted to make a game that felt like it welcomed us. Um, and we have like male, female, non-binary options in the game if you decide to date whoever you want. And we also have a cat if you decide you want to be single, because you know you can be single and still have a fulfilling I life. That. Yes. <laughs> A trip to the Indie Zone always reminds me that gaming isn't just about consoles and big fat PCs. Check out these. 
Blinks are smart tabletop game pieces, and each one knows its own game. It's kind of like a Nintendo game cartridge, and it can teach all the other Blinks how to play that game. Let's have a game. All right. We're I playing challenge Mortals. you. All right. We're playing Mortals. Self. Nice. Smart. Okay. There Is we go. Go. <laughs> Uh, purple. Oh. Purple victorious. Well. <laughs> well played, Kate. This was awesome. I'm Very gonna, close. I'm going to put that down to experience. Right, another game. You almost beat the oh, creator. I'm, off you go. Off you go. We're going to play. Bye. Watch Dogs Legion is set in a post-Brexit dystopian near future London. Had a good run there for a while. Now it's all riots, bombings, and people thrown in cages like animals. A bleak surveillance state where abuse of technology has led to huge unemployment, a privatised NHS, and massive levels of civil unrest. It's not a particularly flattering picture of Britain. Before E3, I went behind the scenes at its developers Ubisoft's studios in Toronto, Canada. The Brexit vote happened when we were a year and a half into development. We'd already settled on London as a location and a big important decision for us was to, you know, address it head on and say, yep, this is just part of our world and our backstory. Brexit in our game is not uh, sort of the cause of the problems that we're depicting in the game world. Brexit. Uh, the causes of Brexit really are the causes of the problems in our world, and that's really how we address it. In the game, the player assumes the role of an anti-authoritarian hacker, recruiting a team of characters to help bring down the regime. A large area of London has been mapped in this game, and every single person that you meet in the city streets is playable. As you interact with them, a unique character, personality and backstory is filled in for them by the game's artificial intelligence. We have video games about the apocalypse, we have nuclear disasters, we have world wars, and now we have Brexit, which really means that the rest of the world is looking at Brexit as a legitimate disaster. And that's quite fascinating in the fact that it's something that we should be taking seriously. It's not something that's just happening on our stage, it's happening on the world stage, and that's particularly very interesting and kind of scary. Here at E3, despite or perhaps because of its themes, Watch Dogs is doing exceedingly well. But it's not the only game to take its inspiration from headlines in the UK. Call of Duty Modern Warfare features a terrorist attack in London's Piccadilly Circus. It sticks close to its series roots, a globe-trotting first-person shooter from developers Infinity Ward where the player spends a lot of their time as a Special Forces soldier. Back in 2009, controversy surrounded the franchise with the inclusion of the now infamous No Russian Mission, which allowed the player to mow down innocent civilians in an airport. We uh, want to put something of redeeming, uh, uh, redeeming quality into this world. We want to basically shine a light. We, wanna, we have a very big flat platform, right? Call of Duty has a, has a huge reach, and so if we were just making something that was sort of benign and just didn't really have anything to say, it would be a missed opportunity for us as creators. But we don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to, we want to sort of shine some light on the way that the world works today and maybe, maybe make people think twice about it. Developers, along with many people who play games, regard them as a 21st century art form which can and should deal with thought-provoking content. Games are just another form of, of media and they're another part of our culture. We as game developers, in my opinion, uh, not only should do this, we have a responsibility to do this, to make games uh, speak to broader cultural issues at large uh, in order to, not, not to edu educate, but to, to provide that context for people who choose to engage in, in, with games as their primary form of, of culture and entertainment. Art, movies, literature and music all tackle difficult and challenging subject matter. Often it's a way of helping us better understand our world. And now it seems the same is true of video games. That dome hammer doesn't scare me. <gasps> Out of the 20 best-selling video games last year, only two don't require extreme acts of violence to win. Not without a fight. 
I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I wonder if it's possible to have a good time in gaming without having to hit, shoot, or explode anything along the way. So this year, I've set myself a task. Seek out the non-violent fun on the E3 floor. Where to start? Ah! No, no. Too violent. So, Jason, is there anything I can do where I don't have to violence anything? Yes, if you know where to look. The Natsume booth is a great example. You have Harvest Moon Mad Dash, farming-based minigames, and then you have sporting games like EA's entire EA Sports lineup. So, my first solid lead takes me to EA Play, where the latest from the FIFA and Madden NFL franchises are making sports fans happy. I'm not a massive fan of this gameplay style. Oh, what's my goalie doing there? Get back and go! And let's face it, it's far too hot to stand in a shipping container mashing buttons today. More My Style is another family favourite getting an island living expansion, The Sims 4. One sporting title I can really get behind is Ubisoft's Roller Champions. It's what would happen if Starlight Express got together with Rocket League and had a baby. And it's playable right now. It's going to be free to play, but apart from this E3 demo, not out until early next year. Final stop, Nintendo. Surely this cutesy Japanese publisher has loads of stuff where I don't have to hit anything. Surprisingly, even here, very few games are free from violence. Although I have set the bar pretty high with a zero tolerance approach. One exception is Luigi's Mansion 3. Ow. 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 Now, I know this looks kind of violent, but Luigi isn't hitting, he's sucking. In the end, I found a lot of fun. But looking around, it's obvious where the bulk of the money is. Violent games do sell. Also, violent games, unfortunately, are better for competition. It's, uh, there are non-competitive games, or non-violent competitive games, but games like Call of Duty or Street Fighter are just better for the competitive aspect. It's unfortunate that people seem to think that violent games cause violent people, but there's really no truth to that, and the proof is out there. I might have had to look a little bit harder for the gentle games here at E3, but... I think I'm going to remember them longer than Gears of Jedi Doom Wars 5, or whatever it's called. Well, a difficult challenge that you set yourself there, Kate. Uh, it, do you know what? I thought it was going to be more difficult than it was, but when I actually got out there on the show floor and started snuffling around, they might not get the media attention of the more violent AAA titles, but there is a lot of awesome gameplay out there if you don't want to bash anyone over the head. What for you has been the moment of the show? I, I think my time in the indie zone. Yeah. You know, half a day with the indie people, I got around five different titles, played them all properly, uh, two hours, and did I mention no queues? Yeah, I know, queues here are absolutely awful. A horrible, horrible situation. How about for you? Uh, for me, Keanu Reeves turning up at the Xbox press event and then reading auto queue as if he were Nicolas Cage. That was... Uh, Really quite a special moment. The internet went into meltdown. Yes, it did indeed. Good year ahead though, do you expect, for gaming? Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for the reboots this year. Some really awesome classics. Ooh. We've got Doom, we've got Wolfenstein, Final Fantasy, loads more, all getting a 21st century makeover. That's me happy this Christmas. Personally, I would prefer to see some new ideas, some fresh ideas injected into video games rather than rehashing old titles and games. Well, at least we won't be fighting over the console. That's absolutely true, Kate. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, it is the end of our time at E3. Yes, don't forget, you can catch us on social media at BBC Click. Do you notice where we are? Yes, yeah. Retro Arcade, best of three. It's a deal. Bye-bye. See ya.